Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to session 3-3 of the Korea Global Forum for Peace. In this session, we will focus on assessing North Korea's intentions in its recent external strategies and explore possible ways to engage with Pyongyang regime under such circumstances. My name is J.R. Kim. I'm a vice president of the Council on Diplomacy for Korean Unification, which organized the session. I'll be the moderator for our discussion this afternoon. Let me first introduce to you uh, our four panels uh, here today. The first expert on my left is Dr. Andrzej Lankov. He's teaching at Kungmin University, and he's probably one of the most prominent North Korean scholar in this country, uh, widely sought after by international media. And next to him is Dr. Andre Lankov, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel Pinkston. He's teaching at Troy University. He is equally prominent expert on North Korea. Next to Dr. Pinkston will be Dr. Kwang Ho Park. He's teaching at Harla University, and he's former Director General of Education Ministry. And the last but not the least will be Dr. Lee Yong Jong. He is a lifelong journalist specialized in North Korean leadership, and he is currently the uh, Director of Center for North Korea Studies at the Korea Research Institute for National Astrology. Uh, following the breakdown of US DPRK summit in Hanoi, North Korea has openly expressed its displeasure with the United States and South Korea. Since then, not responding to any overture for dialogue by the international community, Pyongyang has launched a threat of a harsh rhetoric against South Korea and the United States, while continuously enhancing its nuclear and missile capabilities. Why are North Koreans sticking to such a hard posture? What are their intentions? Under such circumstances, what can you do to engage with North Korea? These are the questions we will be exploring this afternoon in this session. I would like now to uh, ask four panelists, panelists to answer these two questions. We will begin with Dr. Andrzej Lankov. What do you think of these two questions? Uh, yes, uh, for, let's start from the first question. Uh, because I believe that North Koreans, uh, North Koreans are basically their behavior is very logical, very rational, but we have to always keep in mind that their major goal is not economic growth, not uh, prosperity of their people, even though they don't mind economic growth, don't mind prosperity, but these goals are distant second and third. Their major goal is regime and system survival. Uh, so right now, uh, after Hanoi, they found themselves in a complicated situation on two fronts. Or maybe not complicated, a new situation. To start with, they cannot hope to get much from the outside world. For decades, North Korean government has seen the outside world the foreigners, the foreign countries, as essentially large ATMs. You push the button, if you know how to push the button, you get money. It's how they treated pretty much everybody, and usually with great skill and very successfully. But now they understand that no matter what, because of the UN Security Council resolutions and um, sanctions regime, no major country, including South Korea, is willing to give them what they really need, that is money. And this is one of the reasons, not the only, but major reason, why all South Korean approaches to North Korea have been recently ignored. Uh, because what does North Korea need from the South? Reconciliation? No. Meeting of divided family? No. Uh, pop, pop, uh, pop music concert? No. Money. In money and material assistance, and there are no chances to get it. 
on top of that, North Korea was very happy, very lucky to get Sino-American split. Uh, the new Cold War created a situation when, from the Chinese point of view, the value of North Korea as a buffer zone increased dramatically. China, which historically has had quite ambivalent approach to North Korea, now has def decided that it serves the Chinese interests to keep North Korea afloat, no matter what. North Koreans are essentially living on social welfare benefits paid by China, and they know that these benefits will keep coming. So, uh, basically, wh which, whatever they do, yes, occasionally there are some red lines, occasionally North Koreans will uh, take, keep in mind Chinese interests, but in most cases, Chinese aid is unconditional because China needs a buffer zone. China does not want unified Korea, which is likely to remain a lie of the United States. China does not want conflict, civil conflict inside uh, North Korea. It needs stable. So they are giving just enough resources to avoid famine, to avoid serious economic crisis, to make sure that every North Korean will have a bowl of Chinese, cheap Chinese rice, and law enforcers will probably have occasionally a slice of pork. Not much, but enough to keep stability. And it means that North Korean government is in a new situation. They did try to reform the country, and they were remarkably successful in their economic reforms until, say, 2017, 2018. But they cannot do it anymore because these reforms would be impossible without foreign trade, and they cannot trade because of sanctions. And they can, at the same time, they don't need the reforms as much as they used because they have China behind their back. So they rolled back all market-oriented reforms, which, again, worked perfectly well in North Korea, as they have worked everywhere perfectly well. They are trying to go back to the Leninist or Stalinist command economy because it's very good for controlling people and they don't really care much about foreign assistance because they are going to get the back, uh, the basic stuff they really need from China no matter what. And what can be, uh, it's, so we are probably in the beginning of a new era which is likely to last for a long time because quarrel between the United States and, the, uh, and America is a classical situation of the aspiring superpower hegemon and current hegemon. We have seen it over the last few thousand years countless times. Uh, it's go going to last for a long, long time. And as long as uh, China and United States are in rival, rivals, uh, China will provide North Korea with basic material assistance, and it means that North Korea can live quite quietly. Of course, once again, it's not very good for the common people, but they probably will not stuff anyway, thanks to Chinese uh, assistance. And for the leadership, they don't care as much about the economy anymore because problems of Korean economy is not problems of the North Korean government anymore. Those are problems of the Chinese government and will be compensated by the money from the pockets of hard-working Chinese taxpayers. And it's not going to change, as I have said, for a long time, maybe for decades. Uh, so their reaction is quite rational. If you remember that their goal is to keep, stay in power, to cut all exchanges, to uh, use, using COVID as a very convenient excuse to kick out of the country all foreign diplomats and aid workers, Basically, we used to have 23, 24 embassies. Now we have only eight embassies in Pyongyang, most of which are working with skeleton crew. Minimize all kind of foreign contact, foreign interaction, go back to the common economy and enjoy life because the top decision makers will still have luxury, a bit of luxury, not that much, but a bit of luxury. Only Kim family live in real luxury. Other side, living just reasonably well, not more. And it can continue for a long, long time. And they are not re really going to uh, react to the initiative because 
because frankly, the outside world has very little to offer to North Korea. Uh, because sanctions is a stone wall, which prevent any kind of trade, any kind of getting money, and they need only money from the outside world. They don't care about, you know, for say for in North Korea, sorry, in South Korea, divided families is a humanitarian issue. For North Korea, what is divided families? Suspe members of divided families are suspicious people who probably should be in prison camp, but by some reasons still are allowed to be re reasonably free. Uh, so it's not simply their concern. Their concern is getting money. Again, not because they always use it for a luxurious life of the elite or military program. Sometimes they use it for people to feed children everything. Uh, but right now they have enough to feed people due to the Chinese aid. So, most likely, we, we have to admit that we have very little leverage. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we have this CVID myth, uh, because everybody probably now understands that complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization is not going to happen, ever. North Korea is nuclear state, period. It will remain nuclear state in 2025, in 2035, and maybe in 2075. As long as the Kim family is in power, at least, or maybe longer. Uh, and when P uh, foreign diplomacy makes a kind of condition, some meaningful steps towards denuclearization, it's not something North Koreans are going to talk. I'm supposed to say what can be done. Uh, let's be frank, I don't see much. Uh, because I think that combination of bad luck and this, uh, wrong decisions, so decisions which did look okay when they were made, created an absolutely kind of, you know, we are in a dead end, in a tunnel, we, and we're going to follow this very little freedom of maneuver. What I would say, however, first of all, uh, first of all, I would uh, advise all parties involved, especially South Korean government, Republic of Korea government, to be more careful and cautious because now there is a very strong of hardline spirit coming from the, um, I would say, white, uh, blue house, but it's not blue house anymore, uh, from the government. Uh, so the idea that, you know, if they do something, we will reciprocate. If they shoot at us, we should, basically, as North Koreans say, uh, if attacked, we'll revenge hundredfold, thousandfold. It's not a good spirit. It's not a good spirit. Of course, I'm not saying that North Korean provocations, and there will be provocations occasionally, should be just ignored, no, but it should be a kind of rational, measured, proportional answer first. Second, for the time being, North Koreans are happy to live on the Chinese welfare benefits, uh, but one day, sooner or later, they will probably be interested in something more. Uh, because they don't like China, they distrust China. This feeling is few, completely reciprocated. Chinese don't like them, don't trust them. So it's quite possible they will start thinking about some ways out. But in order to get it, the, uh, the outside world should be less tough, should become less tough on sanctions. It does not look, however, possible right now, because sanctions sell quite well domestically, above all in the United States. Sanctions don't have much impact in terms of changing behavior. North Koreans are uncomfortable, but it's, yes, North Korean leaders are uncomfortable because of sanctions. But sanctions are selling extremely well domestically. Every government can say uh, that, look, we are doing something. And it doesn't matter that results are zero or close to zero. Uh, but uh, in this case, there must be some kind of relaxation of sanctions. Uh, I'm talking about economic economy only. Of course, not, no relaxation about sanctions related to the military and uh, military activities and the kind of de dangerous technologies. Uh, and probably eventually some, I would say, uh, Hanoi-style agreement that is exchange of some nuclear facilities for sanctions being partially lifted. And if it starts, there will be a minor improvement. But basically, I would say we are probably in a long, dark tunnel, and I would dare to say I'm almost 60. I'm not sure whether I will live long enough to see the cow we will emerge from this tunnel. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Lankov. Um, I mean, other than taking a very uh, aggressive uh, position for the South Korean uh, new administration uh, to saying that they'll uh, retaliate hundred and thousand it's not folded South, right, South Koreans, Koreans right? Yeah, okay, North, North Korean. Don't say so. They okay. behave like that. Right. If North Koreans provoke, then South Koreans will counter provoke, uh, counter uh, that measures, measures right. Measures. But a uh, new South Korean administration also have announced something uh, known as audacious initiatives. Nonetheless, you know, Kim Yo-jong came forward on that in uh, her very harsh reply that they would not give away their nuclear weapons for the piece of uh, cornbread, uh, which is you know, economic assistance South Korea can afford. But then they were, again, disappointed at South Korean ability to deliver what's been promised under the current uh, international sanctions regime. So uh, it looks, it sounds as if it's very, you know, uh, uh, gloomy that there's very slim chances for North Korean denuclearization. Uh, even when we uh, resume or rekindle the hope of resuming the talks on uh, denuclearization by offering some kind of uh, concession in terms of you know, lifting sanctions or providing economic assistance you know, in return for North Koreans freezing their activities or even abandoning that. So um, I guess uh, the pictures you provided, especially you know, with the uh, Chinese backing up the North Koreans and providing all the things that Chinese needed, mm -hmm. which South Korea is uh, unable to uh, provide, the pictures looks pretty uh, grim. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I would like to ask Dr. Pinkston to make his comment on the same questions. Okay, great. Um, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. First, I want to say these are uh, great questions. They are obvious questions. They're the right questions. They're not brilliant, but they're, they're obvious, of course, in what we need to ask. So why is North Korea hard line, or why do they remain hard line? So it's interesting. Our term just started uh, recently, and I was teaching one of our core courses last week, and we went over the levels of analysis problem in IR. So I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but you know we went through um, outcomes in international relations, you know from the system, the unit, or the individual. And those that have studied political science or IR would be uh, familiar with that. You can go to the next slide. Put the next slide up there. I think is uh, yeah. Just leave. You can just leave that. Uh, leave that there. So um, you know, is it the is it the system, the structure, or is it the unit? So some structural realists, people will look at the world and they'll say, look, it's the structure. North Korea is in a tough neighborhood. They're a shrimp among whales, so they have to protect themselves. The system makes them do this. They have to have nuclear weapons for defense. It's probably what John Mearsheimer would say if he was here. I'm glad he's not working on North Korea. Um, so this kind of justifies it, right? They have to do this for their survival. But we have other states in this neighborhood that don't acquire nuclear weapons, like Japan and South Korea, or Republic of China on Taiwan. You, met, you mentioned, what, eight, somebody mentioned eight uh, embassies uh, in Pyongyang. There are more in Taipei than in Pyongyang these days. Anyway, so, why, so we have to look at, I think we have to look at the unit, look at North Korea, and disaggregate, look inside North Korea to get some idea about the motivations and why North Korea takes the actions that it does. So, you know, we can look at bureaucratic politics and, um, you know, organizational politics. There are different ways to analyze that. Um, we need a kind of uh, multidisciplinary approach. We need historians and historical approaches like Dr. Lankoff does to figure out why this is. You know, psychologists look at the leaders of the leadership, these kind of uh, leadership studies. Um, but in my view, it's kind of overdetermined. You look at any of these um, analytical tools or any of these lenses and it seems to give the same answer, right? Why North Korea pursues this? So all of these uh, approaches uh, get, seem to give us this answer. And then it leads into, so what do we do about it? What's the approach? How do we engage and so forth? And 
In that case, we have to assess the threat. So what is the threat? It's the capabilities plus the intentions, the intentions of the leadership. So we know we have a pretty clear idea of what North Korea's um, capabilities are with their WMD, their uh, Korean People's Army, their delivery systems, chemical weapons, all of these things. Even though North Korea sometimes exaggerates, exaggerates, sometimes they engage in denial, deception, hide their capabilities. We have a pretty good idea of that. Then we have to look at the intentions. And the intentions, we cannot know with 100% because it's in someone's head, right? It's in someone's head and we can't get inside their head. But that doesn't give us an excuse. We don't throw up our hands and say we cannot know. So we have to try to extract and analyze and draw some inferences. And there are many tools and ways of doing that, but also realizing that we cannot be 100% sure. But one of the problems is that uh, many people, analysts, policymakers, journalists, others in my view, they make some uh, errors, they're uh, uh, bias errors in making those assessments. Everyone has human bias, I have bias. We have to try to reduce the bias and get the good understanding. So we have to read the North Korean uh, literature, look at the statements, um, look at the behavior of the regime. What are the actions? What do they do? How do they do their resources? So we have to follow very closely and take this multidisciplinary approach to assess that threat. And I see people from different camps or different political orientations will you know, maybe distort that. You see some people, you know, North Korea is not a threat at all, and look, they're very uh, backwards. And yes, they are a very weak state. I was looking for this draft paper I'm writing now, looking at the, you know, kind of world standings of North Korea. And North Korea has nuclear weapons. It has a million-man army, you know, huge KPA army. But in terms of international system, it's a very weak state. It's a weakling in terms of its economic power, its diplomatic power, its soft power, um, its economy, all of those things. It's extremely a uh, weak country. Um, so a couple uh, points here, a couple takeaway points, uh, given its nuclear armament, a couple of distortions of what I'll be looking for in the future. So one is this notion of coup proofing and the kind of distortions it creates inside North Korea. So the fact that North Korea has nuclear weapons enables the regime to structure the KPA and the security forces in ways to protect the Kim family regime, to, to prevent a coup, coup d'etat. But the same kind of structure and orientation of your military and security forces to do that it distorts the ability to fight conventional wars. And I look, you know, I look at Russia and Ukraine case now. And North Korea is much, much worse than that. But a politicized, um, corrupt military uh, introduces a number of problems. So in terms of fighting a conventional war, North Korea, I think, would have a number of problems. It's the weakest um, state in the region even though it has this very, very large army. But what the lesson learned from Ukraine is even having this uh, distorted, you know, weak, corrupt, conventional military like Russia, look at like Russia, everyone was shocked at, at uh, Russia's conventional military power. But because Russia has nuclear weapons, you know, NATO or anyone else it will not intervene or will not attack Russia. So standing behind this uh, you know, nuclear arsenal, this nuclear shield, they can maintain this uh, distorted, inefficient, inefficient regime for a long time, just as Dr. Lankoff was saying. I agree with that. But here's something else, some other possible unintended consequence. And maybe this is the good news um, or how we would get out of this. Because the nuclear weapons and how you manage your nuclear arsenal it contradicts the, new, the North Korean system. There's a huge contradiction here. So if you look at the North Korean system and how it is organized and how it is managed, you look at the monolithic leadership system, very centralized dictatorship, monolithic ideological system. There's only one way. 
everything is under the control or has to be signed off by the great leader, this great leader system, Suryong system, uh, sultanistic system, whatever you want to call it. But with a nuclear arsenal, you have to have a backup plan. You have to have a second strike capability. You have to delegate some authority. It's not, they're incompatible in many ways. And you see in the, the uh, Workers' Party Congress in January 2021, last year, they created a new position. What it's the, the first secretary, right? It was a tail piece, all right? Which I think is this kind of delegation. They don't name who it is, and you see this kind of rotation around. But if Kim Jong un is in the, the commander, the supreme commander of the uh, KPA, the DPRK Armed Forces, is incapacitated or cannot make a decision, you have to have institutional structures. You have to have technical structure and institutional structure, organizational structure to command and control your nuclear arsenal. How do you, how do you implement the positive controls when you have to launch a nuclear uh, weapon and be sure that it is, is launched? And the, the great leader under this um, monolithic leadership system is, cannot act or cannot give the authority. So this will undermine, I think this undermines in the long run, this uh, Suryong system. So that's something to think about. Oh, and then what, another thing to do, do I get like 30 seconds or one minute? Um, so in South Korea and the international communities maintain robust deterrence posture, and then the engagement can be calibrated. You know, when relations are good, like US and Canada, I see our Canadian friends from the embassy here, we have pretty good relations um, and across a number of issues from civil society and business and politics and environmental, you know, human rights, all of these things. We have a very close relationship. Uh, we cooperate uh, across these issues. And then we look at a situation where relations are very bad, even like Russia and Ukraine are in conflict right now. There's still some contact. We always maintain some uh, contact or communication channels. So you engage according to the, the situation and the environment. So when there's possibilities, we look for those possibilities and we engage, but we ha have to be realistic. We cannot be uh, naive about it. And for South Korea, another thing you can do is maintain good governance. Good governance. North Korea has a number of inefficiencies, economic problems, food security, human rights, so many uh, problems and contradictions in their system that deliver poor governance. South Korea does not have perfect governance. No society or government has perfect governance. There are always um, problems. But to maintain the democratic ideals, justice, uh, you know, meritocracy, um, providing good, pu uh, you know, good public goods, um, those types of things as a reference point for North Korea, um, you also have to focus on your um, internal issues to maintain good governance. And then it makes your foreign policy and your inter-Korean policy, um, you know, kind of natural follow-on. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pinkston. Um, you are saying that we should look at sort of uh, North Korea at a different level of analysis, and based on taking a right approach, right, uh, you know, picking right level of analysis, we will have different understanding of what North Koreans intend to do and what uh, they are going ahead uh, in terms of you know, using their nuclear capabilities or building their nuclear capabilities. And uh, you may be right. I mean, uh, we are probably looking at different uh, you know, issues at a different level of analysis and people are talking different things at the same time. Um, but when you say that, especially it seems as if the level of analysis you are taking is looking into the internal sort of uh, variables within the North Korean regime in order to understand why North Koreans are developing nuclear weapons in order to, because they are a weak state, they need to uh, even exaggerate their capabilities uh, just to use it to maintain tight grip on their internal sort of public. Uh, is, that's probably what you say, I think. I guess this is something we, what we can discuss uh, this afternoon. 
Um, what I would like to do is that I would like to um, uh, open the floor for question uh, after the first round of uh, presentation. And uh, I wanted to give the uh, you know, uh, maximum time for the uh, floor so we can fully, fully exchange our views and opinions on what the, you know, uh, the panel uh, is presenting because those who are sitting on the floor are equally uh, prominent and equally uh, well knowledge on uh, North Korean issues as uh, you know, many of our uh, panels here. Now, having said that, um, I also have to say that when we finish the round of presentation, I also have to invite not just people on the floor, but also people who are uh, participating in discussion uh, on YouTube Relay. Uh, they also can uh, ask questions by submitting the questions by clicking the questions buttons at the bottom of the link. So they will be, if there are any, so far there are none, but if there's any question from the online relay, then we will give them a priority in you know, answering those questions by the panelists. Uh, having said that, I would like to ask Dr. Park kwang Ho for his own ideas and opinions on the same issues. Please, Dr. Park. Uh, Today, I would like to talk about North Korea's nuclear program, where to. The reason why I brought this topic to, this, uh, to those questions uh, uh, is that all the North Korean uh, foreign relations and the justification of uh, Kim Jong-un um, government itself focused on this nuclear program issue. Um, let me see it a little bit different uh, perspective, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Pinkston said. And I would like to uh, share with you the basic structure of uh, the pathway of the North, North Korean nuclear program. Uh, let me directly get to the uh, point. North Korea's nuclear program is the core of its foreign relations and uh, Kim regime's justification. Recently, uh, certainly you heard that uh, Kim Yo-jong, sister of Kim Jong-un, called their nuclear uh, program as our honor, in Korean, Kukche. It means that um, mm, North Korean nuclear itself is considered to be equal to their, um, the country itself. This is the, one of the uh, justification of uh, Kim Jong-un uh, regime. And uh, um, nuclear program of North Korea is closely related, or um, one of the, uh, the only um, variable in their relations with uh, South Korea, United States, China, and Russia. Uh, all the relations can be a little bit different in its shapes, but the uh, uh, basic of the relations is focused on nuclear issues. Mm, definitely the North Korean nuclear program uh, is the threat to the stability and uh, uh, peace in uh, East Asian region and also in the whole world. So for 30 years, the whole world has been um, focused on its efforts to curve North Korea's nuclear program. And some of the um, uh, fruits um, have been made. The first one was uh, in 1992 between South and North Korea, uh, joint declaration of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That was the, the most complete agreement to curve the North Korean nuclear program. But unfortunately, it was not kept. And uh, the second one, and the most uh, prominent one, was in 1994, 
so-called agreed framework between the United States and North Korea. And uh, in that, uh, that was followed by uh, six party talks agreements like uh, uh, 2005, 2007, 2012 agreements. Oh, no, no. In 2012, that was uh, between the United States and North Korea. And let's see the details of uh, those agreements. In those agreements, the Western countries, the whole world was world tried to give uh, some gifts to North Korea, like uh, light water reactor, heavy oil, like uh, uh, 500 uh, metric tons of uh, oil yearly to North Korea. Even North Korea did not have the capacity to keep it. That was a huge amount. And uh, non-aggression assurance. And the electric power supply of 2 million uh, kilowatt. That is uh, same with, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Shinpo, or light water reactor construction. And have heavy oil, 1 million economic humanitarian aid. And uh, in 2012, uh, 240,000 ton of food. In return for those uh, gifts from the outside world, what the North Korea supposed to do was freezing nuclear program and uh, sealing some uh, facilities and committing to uh, denuclearization. Let me, um, let me like uh, structuralize those kind of uh, agreements. It is like only using carrots, energy and humanitarian aid, and uh, security guarantee. And in return for that, the world was getting some empty promises and temporary action, like uh, uh, you know the blowing of some chimneys, uh, those kind of uh, uh, not structural. Uh, react, uh, responses. All those agreements failed. And uh, now, since the inauguration of the Kim Jong un uh, uh, regime, the world began to impose economic sanctions step by step according to uh, Kim Jong-un's development of uh, nuclear program and uh, missile uh, tests. Yeah. So the, the international society accumulated the sanctions. Every time the, the North Korean regime uh, did something bad, the UN accumulated sanctions. So finally, in 2017, uh, the sanction began, became a regime. Those are the sanctions. And the sanction regime, I mean UN sanction, along with uh, 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 unilateral sanctions. And the strongest is the United States secondary boycott. And uh, executing body. Those are the sanction regime. So with this, we can call uh, the sanctions as sanction regime. What I would like to add uh, one more thing in this uh, sanction, the completion of the sanction regime is that as soon as the sanction regime completed, all the South North Korean regime all the South, South North uh, relations became evaporated. I mean, all the North Korean relations, the uh, North Korean foreign relations, were focused on its relation with the United States. And South Korea didn't do not have any room to intervene in that relation. Let me evaporate, evaporate, uh, elaborate a little more about that. 
Can I have a little more time? Okay, thank you. Then, is sanction working? Some analysts and some experts uh, say that uh, uh, sanction is not working at all. Look at the people in Pyongyang. They seem to well off. And uh, on that, I have a little different uh, uh, opinion. Let's see, uh, in 2016, North Korea's export items. The biggest item is uh, in the red uh, letters, coal export to China. And uh, it um, uh, had 44.8% of the whole export of uh, North Korea. And now, the sanction regime cut off all the, all the exports of North Korea. So, the coal export to China, the sanction on that was the biggest impact on North Korea, concerning the, the, the economic sanction on North Korea. And uh, uh, let's see where the money came from coal export flew to. My result of uh, uh, research was that, uh, please look at the, the blue uh, box. The money went to military, secret police, and Office 39. You know the, what the Office 39 in North Korea. So the leadership money, the coal money, uh, flew to the leadership. So it's uh, uh, not completely, but uh, uh, mainly different from the market system, market money. It is the sanction blocked. What the sanction blocked was the leadership money. So um, North Korea uh, became in a hurry. So it decided to uh, approach the United States to lift the sanction. And they came out in 2018, and via Seoul, they went to Washington. And finally, they uh, had uh, Singapore summit and Hanoi summit meeting. The tables are turned. In um, Singapore and uh, uh, Hanoi, the stake on the table was not to give carrots to North Korea, but sanction lifting. So the table turned from using carrots to using sticks. It is an uh, uh, important structural okay, change. Of, you uh, have one minute to okay. wrap up, and you will have another chance to yeah, uh, add more things later. OK, almost done. Uh, we don't know um, the sanction impact on North Korea's uh, people's economy. And uh, from time to time, we hear it from uh, anecdote, like uh, Russian ambassador to Pyongyang um, tells us about the situation in North Korea uh, in his Facebook. And uh, in his, in his uh, talk, Prices of life necessities rose three to four times, and only 26% of the people can use electric power. Those kind of uh, hardship. One more thing. All the uh, major uh, construction projects of the North Korea has been delayed. Like, uh, this is Wonsan um, Kalma Tourist District. It's a huge like city, like Miami Beach. And uh, uh, it was supposed to be completed, in, uh, on, uh, completed by 2018, September 9th. But still, we don't have uh, any news about the completion of this city. Yeah. Kim Jong's way to cope with sanction. 
What can he do externally, provoking U.S. to take in an aggressive way, to, to talk in an aggressive way, like the nuclear test, missile test, those kinds. Of. With, with that, North Korea tries to induce the uh, United States to the talks. And uh, strengthening ties with uh, China and Russia, making external, external enemies. And in that, South Korea is included. They want to make South Korea an enemy. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. And internally, uh, uh, they are they uh, put pressure, put uh, uh, weight on self reliance and uh, frontal breakthrough, so those kind of things. What if what if sanction fails? The only option left. This is what I want to share with you today. The only option left is accepting North Korea's nuclear weapons because we don't have any other means to control or curb the North Korean nuclear uh, program. It means that um, we have to have North Korean nuclear weapons around, so-called on your head, and strengthening yeah, and coexisting coexist as two neighboring sovereign states doing exchange and cooperation and uh, only hoping North Korean people's standard of living rises and it brings democracy in, in, in North Korea and uh, finally change the thoughts of the people on their nuclear weapons. That is the only option left. What should we do? Okay, uh, I guess that should wrap up your first okay. round of presentation. Okay. And I okay. should ask uh, Dr. Lee, Lee Young Jung, to make his comment on the same issues. Thank you very much for introduction. What I'm going to talk about today is Kim Jong-un's understanding in South Korea and the prospect for inter-Korean relations. I will be very brief and short, and I will just focus on North Korea's perspective and how they view Yoon Suk yeol administration and also what kind of changes they want to bring um, in inter-Korean relations. First of all, with regards to the so-called durability assessment, uh, from Kim Jong-un's perspective, you see, this year is the 10th year since he uh, took the hem of North Korea. So I think that Kim Jong-un is now pretty confident that he has solidified his power basis. He no longer has to assassinate Jang, his uncle or his stepbrother. Second, Through the nuclear and missile development programs, North Korea is trying to overturn its stance on the Korean Peninsula and try to secure the dominance over the Korean Peninsula. And during the July um, address by Kim Jong-un, he described South Korea as a country that has to live under the um, threat of the nuclear power state. And currently, the power succession of down to 3.5 generation is now underway in North Korea. In other words, the Kim Jong-un is the third generation that inherit the power, and he wants to create the possibility of inheriting his power to his children. But his children are younger than 10 years old, and therefore, rather than directly inheriting his power to his own children, he wants to take a sort of the interim step, so he will first inherit his power to his sister. That's what we call 3.5 generation power succession work. So he delegates some of his power and authority to his sister, Kim Yo-jong. And also, there is a clause in the enforcement decree of the Workers' Convention Party Convention 
that the first secretary will be the representative of the Kim Jong-un. And also in terms of the regime survivor, what we have to uh, pay attention to is Kim Jong-un's security issues and health issues, especially with the assassination of the Japanese Prime Minister Abe. Uh, North Korea is now paying a keen attention to the security of its leaders. And in fact, the North Korea concealed the death of Abe for 40 days. And then after 40 days of the Abe's death, North Korea finally um, made a press release on that news. And as for the external environment for North Korea, I think things are not that tough, not that bad. Economic issue is still an uphill battle, very difficult to find a breakthrough. And also so-called the Changmadang generation or the MG generation, there is a massive turnover. And there has been constant influx of the Hallyu and Korean pop culture, and this will continue to put pressure on North Korean regime. And this is something that the Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong, they themselves are in their 30s, so they themselves are actually the MG generations. And therefore, they are keenly aware of the risk and danger of the introduction of South Korean culture into North Korea. COVID crisis can have both positive and negative aspect for the regime survivor. So, for example, like there is a significant drop in the number of North Korean defectors. However, if North Korea fails to put COVID crisis under control, then this will drive the regime to the brink of uh, collapse. And during the post-COVID world, uh, there has been some, so there could be some suspicion being raised over Kim Jong-un's leadership. And in terms of the global responses to pandemic, climate change, semiconductor chips, electric vehicles, these are the sort of the hot button issues nowadays when leaders of different countries come together. But for these future issues, the Kim Jong-un has no place to stand. No. Even the Xi Jinping and Putin, um, the China and Russia, they don't really include the Kim Jong-un in the multilateral or bilateral discussion on these future issues. They don't really have the luxury to include Kim Jong-un in their discussion tables. I think that this will deepen the sense of isolation for a North Korean leader. What about North Korea's understanding in or perspectives in Yoon suk government? For that, Yoon suk is like a, a Dalit of India, um, so untouchable um, groups. And Kim Yo-jong, in her address, said that we don't want to take care of each other. Uh, we don't want to be oppressed by South Korea. So she really expressed a um, extreme sense of um, refusal to uh, Yoon Seok-yeol government. So of course it could just be a rhetoric, but that's the sense of abhor that North Korea expresses towards South Korea. And for about three years, North Korea's uh, Nodong newspaper and also the Central News Agency, they no longer mention about South Korea. So there is no official announcement on South Korea. And they just use the propaganda channel to lash out at uh, South Korea. So I think this actually indicates uh, North Korea's perspectives in South Korea and the government. So Kim Jong-un and the Kim Yo-jong's understanding in Yoon suk yeol government um, and the expression of their opinions are filled with a lot of crude emotion uh, and very personal. But no one within North Korea can control this. And therefore, Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jong, if you look at their behaviors and speeches, 
It reminds us of the so-called like third generation of Chebo um, who misbehave all the time. But this is something that the North Korean supreme leaders um, conduct, and therefore no one can actually put them under control. And in order to resume the intercultural relations, what are the things that we have to consider and pursue? First of all, uh, there is a task that needs to be done by Moon Jae-in administration. Uh, yes, it's a previous uh, govern uh, government, but I believe that still there are issues that need to be clarified and explained by Moon Jae-in government. If not possible to be in public, then at least in private, they have to explain uh, about the North Korean issues that they're engaged in. So there have been the uh, three leaders' meetings in Pyongyang and also the Hanoi summit. But what kind of roles did the South Korean government play? That why did the North Korea have such a sense of strong sense of hatred against South Korea after the debacle of Hanoi summit? So I think that for these matters, the clear explanation is required from the Moon Jae-in administration. Otherwise, I believe that the Yoon suk yeol government will have even more and difficult challenges in resolving all the um, in resolving all the issues of um, in relation with North Korea. So for this, I think that the former uh, President Moon Jae-in and also the officers um, have to um, give us the clear explanation. And also, we have to seek some measures to uh, strengthen the research capabilities for North Korea. And in that sense, I think that this kind of session and KGFP can, can contribute a lot to expand and strengthen the research basis for North Korean studies. Currently, North Korea faces some dilemma when it comes to its relation with South Korea. So what's still clear and still valid is that although North Korea rejects and make laugh at uh, South Korea and make South Korea a laughing stock, but Kim Yo-jong and Kim Jong-un cannot deny the fact that South Korea still has its position as a stepping stone um, for them to approach to the U.S. And therefore, though they want to deny South Korea, but South Korea does have some undeniable presence that North Korea has to rely on in order to approach the U.S. But within the um, Kim Jong-un's um, underlings, I think that there are no sincere advisors who can provide bold suggestions as well as clear explanations about South Korea. So yes, uh, there are secretaries like, I mean, there are no longer the secretaries like Kim yong soo who can provide the right advices with regards to uh, how to deal with South Korea. So because of the lack of capable, uh, competent advisors, I think that the Kim Jong-un will have some difficulty um, in setting the right relations with South Korea. And also, if you look at the North Korean assessment on South Korea's offer and strategies, compared to the past, the quality of the assessment is so poor and low. And Yoon suk yeol during the National Independence Day, uh, made some suggestion on so-called the Bold Plan or Audacious Initiative. And the responses from North Korea was that it's nothing but the copy of the Lee Myung Bak's policy. But even the North Korean experts who are against the Yoon suk yeol government um, actually created and came up with this audacious initiative. But the Kim Jong-un, um, I think that he has to overcome the sense of defeat um, or the sense of so-called like being ill-treated by uh, Moon Jae-in and the Trump administration. 
So this kind of sense of the fit is not something that uh, rouse overnight. Rather, I think it's based on his experience of studying in Switzerland um, together with his sister Kim Yo Jung. Mm, I believe that throughout his stay during, um, in Switzerland, I think that he actually suffered from a sense of complex or the inferiority against the South Korea. Now let's take a look at the prospect for the future inter relations. After September, the joint military exercise will be complete this week, so it is very likely that the North Korea will launch the seventh nuclear test after September. Moon Jae-in uh, administration, just 100 days after its inauguration, on September 3rd of that year, North Korea conducted the sixth nuclear test. But as explained by North Korea, I don't think that the North Korea will conduct the seventh uh, nuclear test um, on the expected time um, with all the watch flies. And therefore, for the seventh nuclear test, this is pretty burdensome for North Korea as well. So rather than proceeding to the um, seventh nuclear test, maybe North Korea can replace that with the declaration on the completion of the forward deployment of the um, tactical nuclear weapons. And another scenario that we really don't want to see it happen is the local chemical warfare. So the Kim Yo-jong during the COVID-19 emergency meeting, she mentioned that the South Korea intentionally introduced the COVID virus to North Korea. And she said that the because of this, um, North Korea will annihilate the South Korea. So which refers to the possibility of the potential chemical warfare that they may launch against uh, South Korea. And Kim Yo-jong said that there will be a strong tit for tat. And on August 19th, uh, Machevo, the Russian ambassador in Pyongyang, hinted that the Kim Yo expression actually refers to the potential chemical warfare or chemical bioterrorism, and it was covered by the Joseon uh, North Korea Central News Agency. As you may be aware, Kim Jong Un killed his stepbrother uh, with the chemical agent. Yet these are very bleak uh, pictures uh, based on the assumption of the confrontation. But the audacious initiative that Yun government pursues um, may create a different um, scenario. Despite the provocation and the threat posed by North Korea to South Korea, still there are some elements that uh, can put South Korean Peninsula situation under control. Yes, there are some variables and factors, um, including the U.S. election and South Korean elections, but I think that these could provide some positive um, signals. So while the North Korea suffers from the economic crisis, maybe they can also try to find a breakthrough, and this will open a new chapter and provide us with some breakthrough. And also because of the aggravation of the, its relation with the U.S., North Korea may seek the dialogue with the Yoon Suk-yeol government. This is just an open possibility. And Yoon Suk-yeol government, even before the inauguration, uh, during the campaign period, it said that the it's going to be the first conservative South Korean government that holds the summit meeting with North Korean leaders. And also, he made it clear uh, during the campaign that 
the his government can give more than the progress what the South Korean progressive government has provided to North Korea. So in fact, the inter-Korea meeting uh, was already agreed uh, between the conservative South Korean government and Kim Il-sung. And also during the Moon Jae-in administration, um, despite the multiple rounds of the uh, summit meetings, North Korea could not get the effective economic aid from South Korea. So Yoon suk government can exercise some innovative um, ways to find a breakthrough in this long-standing um, stalemate. I thank you all for uh, panels for your wonderful presentations. I ask you two questions, very simple questions, very general questions. Why is North Korea doing it? Why is, are they sticking to the you know, hardline policy, uh, rejecting all our overture for our dialogue and resuming the um, uh, negotiation on denuclearization? Um, four different people, uh, panels, came up with four different responses to that. Perhaps they are doing it. Uh, in order to, you know, counter their uh, uh, threats from outside, uh, for their internal uh, regime security, uh, have a control over different um, uh, units in a decision-making process, and so on and so forth. And uh, under such circumstances, why? Or what can you do to, you know, make them re-engage with us or lead them to uh, the path of toward the uh, denuclearization negotiation? Perhaps uh, we can do anything about it. It's so structural. Uh, the structure of international dynamics around, surrounding North Korea, Korean Peninsula, make it impossible for us to do anything to persuade them. Or maybe you can improve our South Korea's um, uh, internal governance to uh, give them good exemplary uh, models to follow so that they can maybe uh, turn toward, uh, evolve toward more uh, democratic society, then they may change the policy along with uh, improving our efforts on uh, robust intelligence. Or maybe tightening sanctions would be answer to just you know, compel them to you know, do so, to give up their nuclear weapons. Or maybe because we have uh, disappointed them in delivering what we have promised to deliver in return for freezing or abandoning their nuclear uh, facilities and programs, maybe we can make better promises and um, make better effort to deliver what you promise in the future. Maybe that's what we needed under the new administration. That's something to be discussed, and I guess you people on the floor have many questions on that and also comment on these issues. Before I open the floor for the question, uh, there's a one question from the, um, uh, our YouTube participant. I'll read this to you. And think about this question, how you answer this question, and the questions I raised at the end of each presentation uh, a little while ago, and also uh, questions from the floor or comments from the floor. Each panelist will have later a time to respond to that. But the question from our YouTube participant is as follows. There seems to be growing sentiment in South Korea and the United States that Seoul should have its own nuclear weapons to counter the threat from the north, what do you think about it? Okay, now floor will be open for any questions or comment. Now you will have two minutes the maximum in making uh, questions or comments. And please state your name and your affiliation uh, at the beginning of your question so that we all know who you are. And also you can state whom your question is directed at so that uh, any one of the panelists will take up the questions you are, are making. Please, anybody who wants to have a question or comment, raise your hand and you can freely make your statement. Okay. Okay. I can see any hands raised. I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a, a short comment to Andre oh. and also um, uh, uh, Dr. Pak, um, because Please you said your name and affiliation. Oh, I'm Bernhard Seliger from Hans Seidel Foundation. And just when I was young, my father also told me, I will never experience German unification. So saying that it is unlikely from today's point of view does not mean 
it will not happen. And I would call it quite unlikely it's still there in, what did you say, 2057 or the, the nuclear program. And the same too, that's why we do not have to accept North Korea as a nuclear state, even if from today's point of view, um, sanctions might not immediately bring the effect that uh, the failure is not given by that. And ju just the last point to that, also 2017, we could have sat here and said nothing works. And three months later, they came with their charm offensive. So it's really, um, we should be at least open. I don't say it will happen, but we could be open to a completely different course, which can come very fast. For example, with hunger in North Korea. Okay, I would like to have one more question before, you know, asking the panelists to answer those or comment. So I do have a comment, I mean a question, but I'll ask. Uh, Name I'm, and uh, please. Getting ready to say that. <laughs> uh, Dr. Roland Wilson from George Mason University, uh, Songdo campus. The, a couple of comments if I may first, and then I have a question at the end. Uh, so uh, Andrea talked about North Koreans' rationality, rational. The, and at times I have a difficult, difficulty with the word rational because we sometimes want to perceive rationality you know, based on the theory, of course, rational choice. But the problem is, is that each person in each country and each region has their own rationality. So we may not understand it, it may be irrational to us, but yet it's still rational to them. In their Running around town naked could be rational to somebody. I mean, it could, you know, the, uh, depending on where they're from. So I just want to make the comment. Uh, and then also, I, I think that you're right, though, about China is China is going to continue tacitly to support North Korea, not so it can become big and strong and, and be a pain or a bigger pain to China, but China likes to have a, a barking dog in the front lawn uh, to keep them the world from looking at China and the things they're doing in other parts of the world uh, for that. The, I think, though, that we miss a point for all the panelists about, and I, we, we talked about earlier offline, about structural violence and the, uh, the ability of the regime to control their people, and that's the, what structural violence is all about. And that control mechanism, uh, at the end of the day, is not just used because there's less food or the less to, things to give them, but it's also a mean to keep them from getting stronger and rising up against the regime. So I think we have to remember that in our calculus. So the question is, uh, nukes, the, um, why do we, uh, not just the West, but also Japan, the United States, and uh, South Korea. Why do we continuously fo focus on nuclear weapons instead of focusing on trying to create relationships and engagement and then looking at nuclear weapons when and if the day comes to look at it? So more of a building block process. Sorry for the longness. Okay, so we have uh, so far questions from three audience, including the one from the YouTube participant. Anybody? No, other than who were, the, the question was directed at, I would like to answer the first question on South Korea going nuclear. I'll take, I'll take that uh, question. Oh, there we go. Um, I think it's unnecessary and reckless. And I understand the um, insecurity and the anxiety in South Korea, and South Koreans relying upon extended deterrence and uh, nuclear umbrella of the United States. But if that alliance were to break down, and if the US were to terminate or not provide the extended deterrence, and of course it could happen for different reasons, um, domestic politics in the U.S. or some other kind of causal factor. You know, big breakdown of international system, non-proliferation regimes, something like that. But if we end up in that world, I think it's a very dangerous world because the Republic of Korea has the uh, ability, the most important um, issue is your human resources. And uh, South Korea has the human resources, they have the financial resources, they have the technical resources the capabilities, um, nuclear knowledge, all of those things, they could uh, do it in a relatively short period of time, but it uh, requires some time. And if Republic of Korea were to take those steps, then there would, it would trigger a number of actions, either 
you know, sanctions and, and um, severing of ties and, and uh, bilateral nuclear agreements for its um, nuclear power, civilian nuclear power program, and those types of things. But let's say South Korea is on its own, and we look at the, the balance of forces with um, North Korea. As I said, North Korea is a very weak state, very weak state, except for its WMD and its nuclear weapons. So if Republic of Korea is embarking upon um, acquiring its own nuclear deterrent, there's a very dangerous window before the nuclear weapons are developed and deployed. And if you're North Korea, there's a very strong incentive to strike and to destroy the South Korean nuclear program. Think of Israel and Iraq in um, 1980, or was it 2006, 2007, destroying the uh, Syrian reactor. And North Korea already has nuclear weapons. And if South Korea is going to take that step, and again, North Korea, is they are the ultimate realist, and I think, you know, realist in political science sense about uh, everything revolves around power. In North Korea, power is not everything, it's the only thing. So to prevent that from happening, it would have uh, introduce a very, very dangerous window where you know, North Korea would have an incentive to destroy that uh, program. It makes me very nervous. And I'll leave the rest to you. OK. Anybody else to, uh, want to tackle this uh, question? Any comment from, additional comment from floor about possibility of South Korea going, or idea of South Korea going nuclear? OK. If, Dr. Park? Let me have uh, uh, a chance to talk about the, the feeling of the uh, South Korean people. Uh, according to the poll, uh, more than 70% of the Korean people uh, said yes to uh, having the ability of uh, the nuclear, nuclear weapon. It means that uh, uh, yeah, the feeling here in Seoul is a little bit different from the feeling in, uh, in Washington. We are on the direct threat from the North Korean nuclear weapon. And even though we have uh, the power to retaliate, it means that with the first strike, we have to be destroyed. Then we, we can uh, retaliate. That is totally different from uh, preventing them, preventing North Korea from um, attacking first. That is why we uh, South Korean people and the government tries that hard to stop the North Korean nuclear uh, program. You know, th having said that, North Korean nuclear program is uh, thought to be in its last stage. It's a sad story. Yeah. What should we do? We have to do, um, we have to focus on the last resort to prevent North Korea from completing its nuclear weapons. Thank you. Okay, I think this is not the issue that it will be go away that easily, and this will probably come up more frequently uh, within the next few years. Because now, under the uh, you know, conservative administration, uh, you know, some group of conservative scholars and um, politicians here in Seoul are trying to make loud voice on this particular issue of possibility of South Korea going nuclear to counter North Korean nuclear threat. And I guess this is a question of whether the trust. Uh, on uh, uh, alliance, if we have trust, strong trust in our U.S. ROK alliance, then extensive um, you know, nuclear deterrence would be uh, good enough. Otherwise, we need people to say that we need something else to, you know, to uh, to counter North Korean threat. So I guess this is something that we will probably uh, hear uh, many times in the future. Move on to the next question raised by um, Bernard Zelliger. Dr. Lankov? Uh, well, basically, I would agree 
to some extent that more, maybe I was a bit pessimistic because black swans sometimes fly in. And uh, I can easily say, see how, say, things in North Korea can get out of control, even though we should keep in mind that if now we have some kind of outbreak of civil disorder inside North Korea, uh, in Chinese, a Chinese invasion, Chinese direct in, uh, armed intervention is highly likely. So they will probably help uh, Kim family to basically suppress possible disorder, possible revolutionary movement. But I do agree such things happen sometimes. And after all, well, maybe North Koreans decide to move away from China and become more autonomous, and it also will have some destabilizing impact on their situation. So, well, it's possible. But if we are talking about probabilities, if we are talking about probabilities, I would say next 10, 15 years, I would expect more of the same. And finally, 2075, North Korean Kim families, well, North Korea is still under uh, control of the Kim family. Well, it was a bit of exaggeration, even though I would not completely rule it out. Uh, because, you know, I spent, I'm almost 60 now, unfortunately, and I spent, uh, well, over 30 years of my life uh, listening to the stories that North Korea is just about to collapse. And frankly, I myself contributed something to these stories. I did believe it myself until maybe just a few years ago. Yes, collapse is possible, but, but is there remarkably stable? Frankly, I would say in recent two or three years, North Korea is more stable than ever over the last 30 years. Okay. Dr. Pinkston, I guess the question is also directed at you. Well, I think there are um, unanticipated pressures. North Korea is under a lot of pressure. It is stable. On the one hand, I look at it, it's the almost perfect dictatorship. It's really incredible. The institutional design in uh, how they control the society and maintain the Kim family regime. Um, but dictatorships cannot be perfect in my view. So I can't say it's perfect. It's almost perfect. And these days we see acceleration of, of pressures. And I think of COVID, which was unanticipated. And now we're looking at climate change and the uh, food insecurity around the world food prices from the war in uh, Ukraine. I'm just looking at these floods in Pakistan and these kind of incredible global effects that I don't think North Korea can completely escape. So we have to be prepared in some sense what Dr. Seliger was saying about, um, you know, didn't expect Germany to unify. And uh, we could think of many scenarios, but the reality will be different from the, the scenarios. I do agree it's very uh, stable but we have to be prepared for different contingencies. And I said this, you know, paradox in the nuclear program is in the longer term, I think it will undermine the monolithic leadership system and monolithic ideological system. Okay, I guess that sort of leads to our uh, question from the third uh, person, uh, Dr. Wilson, on you know, improving Korea uh, China relations rather than, you know, uh, working on uh, denuclearization, which does not really get us nowhere. Um, Dr. Lankov? Uh, talking about denuclearization, basically, I believe um, that Dr. Park, Park, uh, Mr. Park Van Ho, Dr. Park Van Ho has already said uh, what uh, I believe we should do in the long run. That is, forget about denuclearization, which is not going to happen anyway, to engage in talks about arms control. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Park, I'm just repeating what you have just said. Uh, yeah, uh, concentrate on the arms control treaty, uh, on arms control treatment, and hope that eventually, well, may, it might take a long time, might not so long time, uh, the exchanges, and the allure of more liberal, more free, more permissive society will change the country to some extent, maybe to a very large extent. It's basically all what we have to do, and we, indeed we have to concentrate, we have to basically forget about CVID. But there is one problem, as somebody who just actually two days ago 
came from Washington DC, I will tell you there is a big, big and talk to a lot of people there, uh, there is a problem. It's very difficult for any American administration to accept to open the state that CVID, the complete verifiable irreversible denuclearization, is a pipe dream. Uh, pretty much everybody in Washington has finally came to understand it. Everybody who has some knowledge and experience. Nobody expects it. But the problem is if any American administration starts acting on the assumption that our goal is arms to control, not denuclearization, it will be seen it will imply that they will implicitly accept North Korea as a nuclear state. And it will be a political, basically, nuclear bomb, nuclear explosion. Uh, because such a president who will start talking about arms control will be immediately attacked by opposition in the Congress, by the media, by the public, for being gutless, spineless, bowing to the pressure. Uh, so if you are an American president or high-level politician, you see that you have nothing to get from arms control negotiations. Because even if it's good in the long run, it's not going to help you. Your political career will be damaged by such negotiations, even if they are very good for the humankind and even for the United States of America. So it's a major obstacle. Yes, this is the way to go, but frankly, well, I don't see how we can go that way. Frankly, even very frankly, I see how we can go that way. It becomes possible if North Koreans demonstrate their capabilities in a very spectacular way. Speaking kind of speculatively, you know, flashing waters in the Bay of California with warheads of new, their ICBMs. Ideally, very, after a very spectacular breakthrough through the American anti-missile defenses. So if they show that they are really here and dangerous, well, talks will probably start. But right now, due to the American domestic situation, once again, yes, arms control is the only way to go. But any American president who will accept it will be immediately attacked by the democratic media. Fox News or CNN doesn't matter. It depends of who, to which party he will belong or she will belong. He will be accused of being a coward, a stupid guy, a gutless guy, not worth of his job. His rating, approval ratings will go down. And even though he will probably stop nuclear, uh, North Korea nuclear development, even though it's definitely good, he or she will pay the price. Nobody wants to pay the price, so most likely Americans will officially repeat this mantra of CVID. But isn't it what sometimes differentiate between the mere politician from a politician and the great statement? Great statement with a vision should be able to, you know, persuade sometimes the public and uh, Congress to take the path. Sometimes seemingly you know, uh, 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 against their national interests at the time, but probably solve national interests better in the future, rather than you know, pursuing the impossible, Let's which costs you tremendous you, amount of resources. You're right, nothing. miracles happen. You're right, miracles happen. Let's wait for a miracle. Uh, because right now, I would say that currently in, in the US system is because of such a deep, sometimes irrational de political divide between the Republicans and Democrats, uh, which they cannot even agree on some very basic policies. Sometimes both sides understand are useful for the country. It will be quite difficult to persuade. And I think that, well, in a democracy, the time uh, horizon of any politician is highly limited. Just a few years. Yes. So, well, maybe, maybe, let's hope. Okay, uh, Roland Wilson just touched upon, I guess, one of the very important issues in resolving the matrix of uh, denuclearization of North Korea, that is, I guess, the China, what uh, important role China can play and how we can work with China to resolve uh, this uh, quagmire. But then again, if there's any question from the floor that relate to China and anything else, please do so, yes. 
Oh, microphone, please. Uh, my name is J.M. Kim, and I'm with the business uh, I am all right. And my question is direct, uh, directed to Dr. Lankoff. Well, uh, my question is very simple and straightforward. Uh, as uh, Dr. Pinkston stated, uh, we have to be prepared for many contingencies, right? And I agree with it. Let's assume that uh, the, the, the North Korean leadership, the Supreme Leader, let's say, dies suddenly. Let's say because of the illness or maybe he get killed. What is your view? I mean, what is the likely scenario of happening in the event of this guy getting killed suddenly? Yeah. Would, I mean, would it open the way for the unification process? Or, or will it facilitate for the unification? Or will it be the other way around? Thank you. OK, any more questions? Now, it is OK to you know, uh, make a comment or uh, have a question. In Korean as well, we have uh, simultaneous translators. This is not an English session only. This is a bilingual session. Uh, that's what it meant to be. Uh, so if there's anybody who wanted to you know, make a comment in Korean, please. No, feel free to do so. And I'm pretty sure there are, uh, I see a number of uh, China experts uh, in the audience, so maybe they can say something about uh, the issues involving China as well. Please. Okay. We need a... Uh, the about American politics or Washington DC politics, which I think is a little bit different than American politics at that time. You know, we have this beltway issue in Washington DC where the thought process is circular. It doesn't leave the beltway. So there are new ideas and new ways of thinking is, is pretty problematic for uh, Washington DC in my humble opinion. I would submit to you though that regardless of media events and the differences between Democrats and Republicans, when it comes to big items, such as nuclear weapons in North Korea or whatever the case may be, there is an under door humility or a, a humble discussion between the Democrats and, and Republicans that will never rise to the point of having differences in whether we want North Korea to have nukes or not have nukes or let them go with it. So I think though that for the Korean audience, Sometimes they get weary of, of U.S. politics and what does it mean for the region uh, and how they perceive uh, North Korea and whether we're going to support South Korea in the future, whether we're going to keep U.S. forces here. All these things boil down from that, that, that beltway circulation, I think, that doesn't get out to the right audience uh, with that. So um, the, I think this is important for the conversation because we've left out the point that the, the alliance here is very important to any type of reapproach or, or way to deal with uh, North Korea in the future as well. We can't, uh, we can't rule them out as being a part of that equation in order to support both the alliance and, of course, support any type of outreach. The, the U.S. military uh, and the U.N. military, the U.N. arm of it, and the combined forces has a great ability to do humanitarian and and in other operations as well. If we ever came to the point where uh, we became less enemies and more of, of um, counterparts in that respect, and so. Okay, that was a great comment. Any other questions from the floor? Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Julio Goodrich from Panama. Uh, this is not a political, just a stand for point because I'm a technical advisor. And sometimes we need to direct, uh, I think, it's not what we want only, so what also we can offer, and also if they want we, what we are offering or asking. Sometimes uh, for a perspective of our industry, uh, we need to listen 
and be part of the counterpart. What I'm trying to say, what you want is, what I, is my need or not? So at the end, it's important unification, but if they wanted to also. So also, if we want something from them, is if they want also to give that. So we have to, in every type of the conversation or business alliances, I think that's the major point. Not only offering or trying to obtain the most of what I can get from the other party, is also talking about, okay, I can offer that, but I also, you need that. Or also, I need you to do that and you are willing to give that also. So to keep ongoing conversation, that's only my comment for that. Okay. Thank yes. you. So I guess important that we find out what North Korea actually wants, I mean, if any, in return for giving up their nuclear weapons, if any. Okay. Dr. Pinkston. Yeah, if I can answer that or, or make comment about that. As far as the arms control, arms control came up and you just mentioned what, what North Korea wants. Again, you have to look at the uh, leadership, the, the Workers' Party leadership worldview and the ideology, how they think in their mind, how they look at the world. And it's a view of the world in a kind of Hobbesian world, Leninist, you know, imperialism, but it's, 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 e it's even more militant. It's more menacing. It's a self-help world. In the North Korean system, how you are socialized, how you rise to the top of the North Korean system and to the top of the Korean Workers' Party, in a dictatorship, dictatorship system with a concentration of power, you cannot, no one can make a credible commitment. You cannot trust anyone, maybe your immediate family member, maybe Kim Jong-un and Kim Yo-jung, maybe they can trust each other. But even on the Politburo, the presidium of the Politburo, the very, very small number, you can't trust anyone in that system. And you certainly can't trust anyone outside. You can't trust China and the Americans. My God, how could you trust the Americans are telling you, you know, suggesting some kind of arms control agreement? And then also you have to think about the endowment effect. When you have something, you ha possess something, it takes on a greater value. They never, in that kind of mindset, that kind of thing, would never give up nuclear we weapons. It's a self-help system. It's the only way for your survival. And exchanging that for collective security arrangement, cooperative security system, it contradicts everything about North Korean mindset and thinking and you're socialized to the top, you don't get to the top of the, the North Korean workers, the Korean workers Party suggesting cooperative security. Let's trade our nukes for some, you know, agreed framework type of thing. So unless you see a radical change, revolutionary change of North Korean leadership thinking, it's just impossible. It's more, it's, and revolutionary change does happen sometimes, like apartheid being abandoned in South Africa. We do have examples of that. Or, you know, collapse of the Soviet Union, something like that, we, we have it. But we would know it when we see it. It's as radical as the Pope, the Pope announcing today that he's become Buddhist and Catholic Church is becoming Buddhist now. It's that revolutionary. It would be that big of a contradiction. So it's just not happening. But the good news is they wish to survive. They're not suicidal terrorists or something like that. They wish to survive, so we have to minimize, don't give them a reason to use their nuclear weapons. Contain them, containment and deterrence until there's internal change. Focus on the contradictions of the system and the inefficiencies of the system. I mean, we deterred Soviet Union for you know, long time, much longer, and they're much more menacing uh, threat. So, uh, and then concentrate on the other things. So, have to be realistic, have to try to cap, but what's the marginal utility of a nuclear weapon for North Korea, what they have now? I mean, what's acceptable? I get in arms control. What about verifications? It's never gonna happen without the, the change of the mindset. So, I'm not, if I'm a US administration president, of course I'm not gonna walk into that or accept them. That's kind of political reality. So, anyway, sorry for the long answer. Dr. Park, and then Dr. Lankov. Concerning North Korean nuclear weapons, 
and North Korean nuclear program. Um, these days, it is considered to be almost equal to the uh, system itself. As I told you, uh, they called it uh, our honor. So it's easy um, for the people to think that uh, unless North Korean regime collapses, we have no, no way to uh, stop the nuclear the, the program. But it's like a um, chess game. Uh, the, the number one priority of the North Korean regime is the, the regime survival itself. And to do that, the most important means is developing uh, nuclear weapons. It's like uh, chess. Uh, unless the king is threatened, you will not give up the castle. So until the uh, North Korean regime itself is threatened, they will not give up uh, no, the nuclear weapons program. So this sanction regime is trying to push the North Korean regime to the point that the regime itself is threatened. Unless we reach that point, they, there's no possibility for the North Korean Kim Jong-un regime give up their nuclear the program. So it's, uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, survival game. And uh, uh, yeah, okay. it, yeah, yeah, that way is, um, I think, an uh, easy way to understand the situation. OK, Dr. Longkov? Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, I would basically continue uh, support what Daniel said. North Koreans don't trust anybody. Frankly, however, I believe it's not only because of the system, even though the system does make contribution. Uh, because we have to keep in mind, why have I don't believe myself to be a very suspicious person. But if I'm so unlucky to become a North Korean dictator, and I don't, I'm not brave enough to jump to the waters of Tedon River immediately, uh, I will have to basically ask one question. What is the major threat? They are facing this dual threat, foreign, classical foreign invasion, Iraq style, Afghanistan style. It's okay, no, not Afghanistan, actually Iraq style only. Um, it's okay to believe in the collective security. They will not believe because of what Daniel explained. But probably we, after all, we saw Americans who promised not to invade Cuba, and they did not have not invaded Cuba, even when it could be seemingly been done easily and cheaply. But there is another part of the story. The second threat, actually first threat, is domestic threat. They, nobody will guarantee their security against a domestic rebellion. Nothing but nuclear weapons. Why? Because if there is a rebellion, I'm not going, saying that they are going to uh, nuke one son if it rebels against the government. Probably not. But as long as they have nuclear, they saw what happened in Libya. As long as they have nuclear weapons, they are free to be as brutal as possible. The outside world will do nothing. CNN and New York Times and Figaro and whoever will run huge terrifying stories and gory pictures and everything, but everybody will be outraged. Nobody will lift a finger because it's a nuclear state. Capable of attacking pretty much every city in the planet right now, already. So they understand they need, and no collective security will guarantee them against domestic, develop, uh, domestic uprising. And so they need nuclear weapons, not only to protect themselves against invasion, but to make sure they can suppress domestic resistance as brutal as necessary. Uh, then question about what will happen if Kim Jong-un is killed, or I believe he is not very likely to be killed because North Korean elite is united because they are in the same boat and they don't want to rock the boat. But well, things happen. He, after all, he has result healthy lifestyle, drinks too much, smokes too much, seriously obese, and so on. Uh, so he died. First, uh, I think they have made preparations. Because no matter what, 
Moon Jae-in administration wanted us to believe in April 2020, personally, I don't have the slightest doubt that at some point between evening of the 12th of April 2020 and morning 15th of April 2020, three days, yeah, 11th, 14th, 12th, yes, a bit more than three days, something serious happened to Kim Jong-un. You remember the story about him being dead. He was not dead. And there were good indicators he was not, but he was really seriously sick. And soon afterwards, they made institutional changes. Because basically it was mentioned here, I believe by Daniel, the first secretary, a new position. I think it's not only a deputy, but also emergency replacement. Uh, so they introduced emergency replacement. They uh, uh, basically gave members of the permanent committee, standing committee of the Politburo, important powers, including powers to convene important government meetings, even without leader, which is important. And they obviously made some preparations. Probably they already have a secret sort of vice president, whose name is, I strongly suspect, I don't know for sure, I strongly suspect is Kim yo -jong. So if he, well, I'm not sure, but likely. Anyway, so if he suddenly dies, they already have replacement mechanism. And because the elite understands that if they start quarrel between themselves, the entire system will go down, and they will have no future in Korea without Kim, they are likely to be united. So if he dies, yes, risk of instability will increase significantly, but not as dramatically as would happen in a different situation. Most likely they will... Um, replace him with somebody who's, with a person who is already, probably already is a, a secret, top secret first secretary, secret, secretly held position of vice president, I would say. And uh, the, gov the elite will accept this person because it's better to be united. And on top of that, we of course have Chinese factor because if things get out of control, revolutionary way, Chinese tanks m are likely to be on the streets of Pyongyang in no time. So yes, his sudden death will significantly increase the reduced chances of long-term survival of the regime. But significantly reduced doesn't mean it will be zero. It will be well above zero. Most likely they will survive this crisis, I would say, maybe with help of Chinese soldiers, maybe with just, they'll probably handle it themselves. Okay. With that, we probably have time. Maybe we already ran out of time on our clock, but. Maybe, perhaps one more question, if there's any. One last question, please, yes. Good afternoon, I am from Bin University. My name is Peter Verld, and I would like to ask a question to Dr. Lee. So you gave us a very pessimistic outlook. But local chemical welfare or the bioterrorism, you mentioned that the there is a possibility of the using biological weapons. Can you please elaborate on that possibility? Because this is shocking and too serious. And I think it's somehow too pessimistic, uh, but I think still there is a possibility, right? That's why you mentioned that during your presentation. So can you please elaborate on the potential chemical warfare or biological terrorism that could happen on the Korean Peninsula? And keep your answer within two minutes of time, please. Media and also the scholars, they talk about the North Korea's provocations. And somehow, however, it has been as of the taboo uh, to talk about what kind of damage South Korea can suffer uh, from North Korea's provocation because we all have a sort of the trauma of North Korean provocation and attack. So even the South Korean army and military forces, if there are, if you look at their scenario against the North Korea's preemptive strike, 
yes, uh, if preemptive strike happens, then the scenario assumes that there is a large number of casualties happening in Seoul and throughout South Korea, but they refrain from officially uh, talking about this. But with regards to the local chemical warfare or the biological warfare, in fact, if North Korea, if I think that if there are too much pressure for North Korea to proceed on to the seventh nuclear test, and also from North Korea's perspective, let's say that the if the seventh nuclear test is not that beneficial for North Korea to bear all this kind of burden, then North Korea may uh, divert its resources and conduct some chemical local warfare because North Korea already completed its nuclear program, so the seventh nuclear test is not necessary for North Korea. But in the past, the North Korea uh, provoked South Korea with the shelling of Yeonpyeong Island and also the Cheonanam um, crisis. So in the sense, North Korea tends to be pretty radical. And so currently, the Kim Jong Un and Kim Yo Jong, they have a very negative sense of hatred against South Korea. So based on all these factors taken into consideration, I think that still there is an open possibility for local chemical warfare and biological warfare happening on the Korean Peninsula. And if North Korea is determined to conduct this and launch this warfare, then just like the case when he assassinated his stepbrother uh, with the chemical agent, I think that he will use all kinds of uh, methods and measures in order to conceal that it was conducted by North Korea, Any, which means that everyone can guess and make assumption that it is done by North Korea, but there is no evidence to back up that um, assumption. So this is something that I think North Korea will take. Um, I think this is a very typical strategy that North Korea utilized for the assassination of the Kim Jong-nam. And also based on the uh, Ambassador Machagura and based on the official messages delivered by North Korean leaders, um, yes, this is just a guessing and assumption only. But I think that the possibility is still open, and therefore we have to come up with the countermeasure and plans for that. Almost two hours of discussion. Now we understand why North Korea has to you know, stick to their hardline policy, uh, developing their nuclear weapons, and so on. Uh, there are many factors that makes them to do so. But as to the question of under such circumstances, now that we understand why they have to do that, what should we do to make them you know, take the path of denuclearization? That still remains unanswered and to be a topic to be uh, discussed further in the future. And that's where I guess we need all our wisdoms uh, to put together to find the right solution to uh, resolve the issue. And having said that, I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists here uh, this afternoon for a wonderful presentation and also all you who have participated in this session, uh, not just on the floor, but also from uh, the uh, online uh, broadcasting. And um, I hope this is not the first uh, session to discuss these issues, but we will probably have more opportunities in the future to continue our discussion in different uh, forums and occasions. And once again, thank you for your uh, patience and attention. This will wrap up the session. Thank you very much.